Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our May 2023 monthly conference call. Thank you for joining us today. And this is Jeff Hibbler along with Randy Farina. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone to please send in any questions or comments to info at EccentralWealth.com. We will address these before the end of today's call. So since our April call, broad equity levels and bond market yields are currently trading near where they were roughly one month ago. Uh, what, you know, in the interim, the price, price movement's been anything but flat, but we do seem to have entered into a range trade in these markets. Some of that range trade can be attributed to the economic data that we've been seeing over the course of the last month. And I would characterize it as receiving mixed signals. Uh, employment and consumption are generally holding in reasonably well. Uh, you know, in manufacturing, it's been showing some signs of slowing. Uh, and inflation is slowly declining, but it's been sticky. Uh, you know, the Fed, as they've been reiterating, is data dependent. And really, markets are trading the data and recalibrating Fed policy expectations, which helped to set up this range trade for now, at least. Of course, another factor in markets is corporate earnings. Uh, and currently, we're right in the middle of first quarter earnings announcements. Broadly, so far, I think we're about halfway done uh, with S&P announcements. Revenue growth is up about 5% year over year and has been running ahead of expectations. Uh, earnings, uh, they've been flattish, and uh, but so far, those have also been better than what was projected to be some modest declines. So Randy, I know you're busy reviewing earnings reports and appreciate you being able to join today's call. Um, wanted to see what your take is on first quarter earnings so far. Sure, Jeff, I love the monthly call. I wouldn't miss this. And I know you're busy as well. I, I know you made me say that, but fixed income guys are busy as well during earnings season. I'll just put <laughs> that there. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you recap the overall 5%-ish on the revenue line, flattish on earnings. Uh, you know, step back a second. How much should quarterly earnings uh, dictate stock price movement? In reality, it shouldn't have that much impact because um, stock prices should try to reflect the long-term cash flow growth and margin of a company's you know, potential. Uh, but the market moves on daily, monthly, and quarterly earnings uh, uh, reports. Uh, so it's part of the job. Uh, you know, our the team, the uh, investment team at Accenture, we take a long view on names and we have a valuation model that takes into account more than one quarter. It's years and decades and how we're trying to forecast and project cash flow and margins and uses of working capital and capital expenditures and, and, and just using the three financial statements to help us come up with what we think the longer term cash flows can be for an industry, for a company, et cetera. So, you know, we go through the quarterly earnings and sometimes that creates the opportunities when the stock market over or under reacts. So if you see trading sometimes after a batch of quarterly earnings, um, you know, that's what we're trying to do, trying to capture what we hope is some uh, knee jerk uh, uh, reaction to, to earnings. So in general, you know, the expectations for earnings this earnings season, remember, this cycle of recession coming down the road has been going on now for at least four or five quarters. You know, right when the war happened last March of 22, you know, most of the thought was high energy prices, uh, you know, significant inflation uh, increases from supply chain that the war impacted was going to cause a recession. And it still probably will. It's just not happening as uh, quickly as uh, <clears throat> I think we thought a year ago. So some of those expectations from last year have had been built into the earnings estimates that were now going to play out over the next couple of quarters. Remember, the dollar... Uh, was very strong last year. That was a headwind for companies. That is subsequently reversed. Energy prices were very high in the second and third quarter of last year. That, again, has subsequently reversed. Inflation was much higher a year ago, still way above target currently. But again, a lot of that has 
been uh, somewhat mitigated over the last three or four quarters with the aggressive Fed uh, hiking cycle. So the expectations are rather for low to no growth this year. Uh, if you look at aggregate S&P earnings, you know, there's they're going to be down for the year. Now, why, why, why is that? Let's disaggregate that for a second. Some of it is energy companies. I was just looking at ExxonMobil this morning. ExxonMobil last year in this quarter that just got reported made $8 billion roughly, or $9 billion in net income. This year, they just earned $12 billion. But remember, March of last year, Q1, you didn't have the big oil price impact. It wasn't until the second and third and fourth quarters. So for the next three quarters, Exxon will, will make way less money than they made last year. But last year was a you know peak cyclical high for Exxon. So that's an example of a company that is impacting the S&P earnings for this calendar year. Another one is Meta. Meta reported, you know, they had their struggles last year, and they reported about $7 billion in net income just this past quarter, same as the quarter a year ago. But then that earnings trajectory over last year's Q2, 3, and 4 went down to $4 billion. So Meta has probably bottomed in their earnings cycle. So you have this constant individual company uh, perspective as an investor that I'm looking at, versus the top-down macro, how it all rolls up, what people are putting out for the uh, economy and interest rates and global impacts. You know, you got significant global tension still with China and uh, Taiwan. You still have the, the war going on. Um, you know, so again, all that in, in impacts that estimate. So to make a long answer, as always on these monthly calls, I'm just trying to give some perspective of, you know, from a, of a, a how the team looks at it and how it all rolls up at an aggregate level. The aggregate level is something that I look at, but I don't pay much attention to, to be honest. It is more the individual company's um, expectations and reasonable um, estimates that we think they can they can make is what drives our decisions to own or not own our stock. And again, we try not to let one quarter of earnings be um, uh, all in, meaning it's not everything. One quarter of earnings is not everything. Again, we all know the examples. Look at Meta last year, $90 after the October report, stock fell 25%. You know, now it's back to 240, which is about where it was earlier last year in 2022, still well off its highs. So again, got to take all that into account. Um, we'll get through this earnings season and then you'll start to focus on next earnings season. And again, the general consensus is that a recession will happen late in the year. An economic slowdown will impact companies' abilities um, to, to uh, have earnings growth and, and thus the market will calibrate that. Uh, Okay, but then we need to think about 24, 25, and 26 in, in, in the market. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that into account when it's pricing stock. So that, that's my long answer, Jeff. I apologize. Well, you know, pick, picking up on that, um, you know, the just, you know, kind of me looking at it from afar, you have you know, revenues higher. And again, you know, we're in the middle reporting. Like you said, there's lots of nuances when you get to the company level um but earnings you know basically being kind of flat you know that tells me that probably profit margins have been compressing a little bit right. um are you seeing that in companies or is there is there maybe like some companies that are are taking share and holding margins or kind of you know what have you been seeing from that perspective? so it's all it's 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 all of that and you know not everybody wins, not everybody loses. So it's usually a mixed bag. You're coming off peak margins, probably for industrials, materials, probably even consumer staples, some healthcare, especially the one, the names that benefited from COVID pull forward. So the profit margins in most of 2022 were record across the board, especially in Q1. That's what we're comparing this earnings seasons to last year, uh, Q1. So the, the the profit margins, I think, peaked at around 14, 15 percent. 
for the S&P. And, and th those were a, a, a high. They will not sustain at that level. So this, this rebasing a little bit of earnings um, uh, or margins is, is fine. And that's why the expectations is, is for earnings to be down this year. And some of that is just a rebasing of those, you know, those probably cyclical or, or peak margins for this cycle uh, that need to be rebased because of, you know, a lot of the COVID issues that impacted demand and supply chain and any pull forward. Again, Home Depot, an excellent example. It took them a decade to add $80 billion in sales um, from a revenue perspective, and then they did it over two, four, two years during COVID. So, you know, that impacted their profit margins up, and now they're starting to hit a wall of, you know, um, inflationary wage pressure and just again a rebasing a cyclical there is some mean reversion in, in margin so yeah margins down that's fine uh, it's this quarter really in the, the longer pattern or the next few quarters should be that continues where margins are off of last year's high for most overall. Again, it's going to differ company by company, sector by sector. But then if that recession is mild, then the rebound is probably second half of 24. If the recession, you know, again, I don't know what the recession will be, whether it's a hard landing, soft landing. There's too many factors at play that I don't think anybody can accurately predict. And if someone says they can or in, in hindsight, someone's going to be, oh, he called the recession. Okay, it's it's kind of hit or miss on that. But uh, if it's a hard landing, then clearly you're going to have revenues impacted, margins impacted more, uh, and and that will hit the stock prices. Uh, I'm not in the hard landing. I do think a slowdown happens in the second half, um, and you know that that can change as the year goes on. So that's why we have cash in the portfolios. Again, we're constructing what we feel are more defensive portfolios at the moment, given more uncertainty than normal, uh, different set of interest rates than what's been normal, uh, and, and just trying to be um, uh, aware of what we know and what we don't know and, and not bet too much one way or the other. And, you know, one point you made on kind of on the, the topic of margins, I think in prior calls and certainly in some of our team calls, you know, you, you've talked some about companies, especially kind of in the tech area where maybe they overhired somewhat, that they've been getting ahead a little bit in cost cuts, um, probably a little earlier this cycle than maybe a typical cycle. Are, is yeah, that kind definitely. of still your thought? Yeah, I mean... I mean, it's obvious in hindsight, they overhired significantly, all of them, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, less so Apple. In fact, Apple was one of the ones that didn't actually have a significant increase in their hiring growth rate. Uh, so yes, that was pervasive across most tech companies scrambling to get new employees on board. And then what happens 12 months later, they're like, I think we might have overdone it here. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to uh, right size the cost structure, and and that's happening before the revenues have slowed down. Most, or you know, I've been a part of two recessions, 08 and really 01 was kind of a recession, right? I mean, the market valuation was crazy coming out of COVID, but there was a, a, a recession post 9 11. Uh, so each one has been different and we've studied the cycles of other re recession, uh, especially in the early 90s. So what usually happens is revenue slows, then the companies react by cutting headcount, right-sizing the cost structure. This has been the most flagged recession in history. And so companies have had a year plus to try to get in front of the cost base uh, right sizing. So companies have slowed hiring. Companies have, you know, clearly the high tech names have announced layoffs. Meta, Amazon, Google, the poster childs for over hiring have 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 let you know tens of thousands of people go um, in aggregate. Uh, so 
as the recession hits, whether it's late this year, early next year, companies have already started to do that. They'll, they may even be, I don't want to say done with it because it's always an ongoing process, but they'll have chopped wood, as they say, well before uh, a normal recessionary pattern. So again, it's all about just not trying to make a bet one way or the other, hard, soft, uh, you know, um, and, and just trying to have balanced portfolios at this point, Jeff, because it's it, it it's not a normal cycle and anything but normal over the last three years, as you know, same from your seat as fixed income. So that's how we're approaching it. Uh, you're right, they have been ahead of the curve. Uh, we're all waiting for employment to weaken, which will help with the Fed's uh, rate cycle so they can stop. Um, but but that's that's the situation we're in. Companies are ahead of the normal recessionary uh, right sizing of their cost structure. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, you're spot on. This has been anything but a normal cycle, and certainly the you know the, the Fed has been one of the main factors in that. And you know we we have uh, the Fed decision tomorrow again. You know roughly every six weeks. Um, and, you know, do you want to preview your what you think will happen, Jeff? Why, yes, Randy, I would love to preview what I think is going to happen. Please. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, our expectations tomorrow uh, that the Fed will hike by another uh, quarter of a percent. Uh, and, and frankly, that's pretty well priced into markets at this point. Uh, that's going to bring the the Fed funds target range to a five percent to five and a quarter percent, and that's in line with uh, their projections. Every quarter they release economic and funds rate projections, and that would bring them uh, in line with at the end of March where they expected um, the the Fed funds rate to end up. So. Along with that, you know, I think the the Fed's likely going to adjust their language in their statement. Uh, the, they're going to indicate that, you know, this this they'll probably pause after this, uh, at least for the time being. They're certainly going <clears> to <throat> allow themselves some optionality, because, as we mentioned earlier, you know, they're 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 always data dependent, but but they're. I would say kind of highly data dependent at this point. Um, and so as the economic data evolves and comes in, they're, they'll be prepared to adjust policy accordingly. Uh, and, you know, it may very well be the last hike of the cycle, but depending how the data evolves, we, we just actually saw overnight uh, Australia's central bank, uh, they had paused and uh, then last night they delivered a hike that was unexpected. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really going to depend on how sticky does inflation remain and, and how does growth and employment hold up. Have they and, shifted, Jeff, to, sorry to interrupt, uh, no. the tightened financial situation, the banking, you know, we've had four or three regional banks now uh, effectively go bankrupt receivership taken over whatever you want to call it uh cease to exist uh you know three of the largest or the top 10 you know uh, bank failures ever like how does you know is is that the primary concern now of the fed is inflation secondary like how, have things shifted in the last month and if not why haven't they from the fed's perspective yeah, that's really good. You know, that's that's probably the question, you know, one of the questions that markets are grappling with right now. And I think there's a couple things going on with it. Um, you know, one, I think speaking to their challenge of bringing, reinstituting price stability, uh, you know, they hiked last month right after um, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank failed, and and yeah, Silicon Valley was the second largest um, at that point uh, in history, and they're likely going to hike again tomorrow. You know, the week after First Republic failed, which is now the second largest failure. So, there, you know, that that is an acknowledgement of 
of what their man, you know, their mandate, part of their mandate is, is price stability and, and they're, they're not hitting that. So, um, you know, that they, I guess from that standpoint, then what we've seen in the last 20, 30, 40 year, well, 20, 30 years, they've, they've been probably more hawkish than what one would have thought. But along with that, what, what they're trying to do with their policy is keep essentially the, the bank liquidity stresses, you know, at, at regional banks. Um, and I would say some generally somewhat smaller regional banks separate from their dual monetary policy mandates of price stability and, and maximum employment. Right. And so they did create that, um, you know, BTFP facility that allowed banks to borrow for a year um, at, at the, the par value of the loans rather than the market value. And, and also, you know, the discount window, I think they relax that a little bit too, to address the li liquidity stresses. And, you know, if you think about 2008, that, that was a, a, a credit stress event for banks. Uh, it, it was essentially, you know, their, their assets and the credit worthiness of them, the loans they had, the securities, et cetera. And of course, there was just a lot of unknowns uh, with how those items were packaged. This stress in, in what we're seeing thus far is is in their is on the liquidity and and how they fund themselves side, uh, essentially the liability of their liability side of their of their balance sheets. And so, so that's vastly different. It's not an underwriting of bad credit that got packaged up into good credit. It's a mismatch. Again, as an equity guy, tell me if I'm wrong on the fixed income side. It's a mismatch of their assets and liabilities. I mean, it's they keep the Fed has pointed out that Silicon Valley was poor risk management. Uh, but some of it is that they hiked so fast that you did keep keep catch some of these uh, CFOs and finance teams flat-footed in their uh, in their asset matching. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're exactly right. Um, you know, it, as always with, you know, there, there's, there's certainly been, what, what this has highlighted has been some essentially business model problems with some of these banks with, you know, relying on very large uninsured deposits, mainly corporate, um, and you know, Silicon Valley focused in the, the the tech and startup and that that sort of sector where, um, you know, deposit flight was just was extraordinarily rapid, um, in a, in a very concentrated uh, number of accounts, and so. You know what they've run, what they ran into is you know they owned a lot of securities which were high quality, treasuries, agency mortgage backed securities, not credit problems, but exactly to your point, Randy, the the asset and liability mis timing mismatch that that they ran into. Now, from the other standpoint, so the Fed's liquidity facilities should should help to address those kind of things. Yeah. Now, the other side of it is you know, banks that aren't able to attract lower cost deposits, you know, they, they need to pay up for those. Over time, that does affect profitability yep. and and bank capital, et cetera. Uh, that's, that's a bit more slow moving. You know, there, there's also some concerns with, with some banks with commercial real estate and what exposure is there. Um, but, um, you know, at, at this point, yeah, it, it's it's that asset liability mismatch that that these banks had, you know, very concentrated type position. And something I I saw, I, I might have brought this up before, like you know, Silicon Valley Bank. If you, if you look at the the regionals, super regionals, large banks, their their average deposit was something like one point three million, and 
the next one after that was signature and it was something like 500,000 average per deposit. If you look at most of the, the, the regionals and super regional banks that we kind of view as a more traditional type of bank, their average deposits are somewhere between like 10 and $30,000. Right. Uh, just much broader deposit bases than, than what those other ones, but it, it, it's certainly something that we're, 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 you know, watching very closely as the situation evolves. Right. And, and let me give you a perspective on what we've been doing in the funds and how we're positioned going into that, because, uh, you know, that's a concern uh, for clients with, with, with positions in, in the portfolios we own. So we've been underweight general banks across all the strategies that we want run on the equity side. We did have exposure in Schwab, which has sold off significantly, and USB, a regional bank out of Minnesota that sold off uh, significantly. We also own JP Morgan, but they're a money center bank, very diversified business. In fact, you know, go back and read during 21, Jamie Morgan, uh, Jamie Dimon many times mentioned, we're not going to buy low yielding treasuries. We're just going to sit in cash. You know, he was right. Uh, now he's picking up assets, you know, probably at pennies on the dollar. Uh, you know, we bought a wealth management business out of First Republic. That's pretty good. Uh, so the money center banks, the big four or five, will benefit from this. Uh, there was a little bit. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, business model, I guess, in hindsight, risk, concern, or flawed uh, from from some of these other ones. But again, I, no one expected rates to go from one to five overnight. Uh, maybe maybe that is. Uh, the reason for the flawed business model, uh, but that wasn't something that I don't think people thought was possible. So what are we doing? We're not adding to any of these regional banks. Uh, you know, we don't feel like we can accurately predict what the earnings stream will be in two to three years. Like you just mentioned, Jeff, if they have to now compete more aggressively for depositors, meaning raise rates, then that squeezes NIM, that squeezes your earnings. So what your earnings trajectory will be could be lower. And then what is the multiple that you put on those earnings? Meaning, you know, how do you then try to um, take future earnings into consideration? And with that, you use the PE multiple, price to book multiple, some multiple that represents the future growth from the next couple of years earnings. So I think it's very difficult, very opaque, trans sometimes not as transparent as just regular industrial type companies that produce you know um, a product or a service and it's it's a much easier um, analysis to to figure out longer term earnings trends these banks it's it can be you know what the interest rates are going to be what their uh, balance sheet looks like what their tier 1 capital ratio needs to be and what the regulators say so we're not stepping into them. We've held on to Schwab and USB and we're continually debating it. Uh, they could get sold, they could get kept. Uh, I, I, uh, I know we've talked about it as, early, as, as recently as Friday and then again this morning. So it's something we're constantly reevaluating, but I need, you know, I also want to highlight that, you know, in most portfolios, we have 35, 40 names you know, the, we're always going to have a name that's not working and that's okay. Uh, we, we don't want to own those names, but it's, it's, it's not realistic to think when the market's up 9%, every stock in the portfolio is up between seven and 10%. No, some are up 40, like bookings.com, which was a bet that we had on travel that we kept for two years when it didn't work for the first year or well, the first, you know, seven months of last year it really didn't work at all. And then took off from October on and we thought it was fair value and we sold it. So those stocks are up 40. And then you have some of these regional banks or one regional bank in the value portfolio down significantly and USB down 30% year to date. So we're always going to have names up and down. What we're trying to do is just always reassess, recalibrate, make sure we're okay with short-term pain, potentially, knowing that given our work, our fundamental 
you know, analysis of the company and of the industry, we feel confident that, you know, the market's overreacting to the, to the, to the near-term headwind and, and we'll, we'll, we'll be okay in, in, in the longer run. And if and when that changes, then we'll sell the stock. We, you know, whether it's for tax loss sale, which, you know, sometimes that's what we say, but it's a mistake. We're taking a loss. That was a mistake because now we're recognizing either the thesis has changed or our outlook for the earnings have, have changed significantly. So we want to, we want to uh, make sure we're always recalibrating, readjusting our view. So again, let me just wrap it up. We've owned Schwab and USB. We did not own any of the ones that are gone. Thank goodness. Um, we have always been underweight banks in all the portfolios that we've run. I can probably can say that will not always be the case, but that is a bias because we just think there are much better businesses with much better returns on equity potentials and growth potentials, and we'd rather own those. Thanks for that summary, Randy. And I'll just talk on, uh, touch base on it really quick from the fixed income side uh, that, you know, in fixed income, our uh, focus has been mainly on the uh, the large money center banks that we felt that um, not only their kind of broad earnings power, you know, they, they have more diversification across their earnings with trading and investment banking and capital markets types of things, um, you know, presuming that they manage those well, as well as the much tighter regulatory scrutiny uh, that they are under. That's where we've uh, generally generally been uh, positioned in, in fixed income for our for our banking uh, exposure there. So, um, one other qu question that we we have received somewhat, and it's timely given uh, what's going on, is is on the debt ceiling. And uh, you know, yesterday Treasury Secretary Yellen uh, notified Congress that the the date the Treasury you know could. And it's could because it's projections fail to meet obligations could be as early as June 1st. Uh, it, of course, like I said, that's a could uh, could be later, July, August. It all depends a lot on tax receipts uh, and, and corporate receipts coming in June that are they're unknown. But, you know, prudence for on, on her part to to notify the parties to essentially really kickstart them uh, with discussions. You know, unfortunately, uh, U.S. and servicing its debts has become a political football, uh, and we've seen it a lot over the last, call it 10, 12 years. Uh, and but there is a difference between the ability and or willingness to to service them. Um, so the good news is both parties are now finally reengaging in the discussions. Our our sense on this is that you know due to this kind of tight time frame at this point, June 1st, uh, that a short-term extension will likely be passed uh, that could then give them time to have a more comprehensive solution or longer-term, um, you know, passage for, for the debt ceiling. Unfortunately, these things tend to go down to the 11th hour, maybe the 59th minute. Um, that's just the way DC works. Uh, you know, we, we do think it's a low probability that the U.S. does have a technical default. Yeah, the ramifications of it, you know, they're just very bad. And one point, though, that, that we do want to make on this is that Treasury securities themselves do not have cross-default uh, provisions. So if, if something happens, they miss a payment on a T-bill, that doesn't affect uh, other treasury securities. Um, but again, you know, we think the, the, the likelihood, the probability on this is it, it's going to go to the 11th hour, but the actual occurrence is very, very low because there are, you know, bad consequences for it. Um, but that said, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a narrative in the markets. Uh, it's as they push it further, it, it can create some choppiness. Sometimes that can create opportunities for us. I was uh, just going to say that. Yeah, yeah. We we know this will come down to the last minute, right? Nobody's got any 
sense of cooperation among parties, unfortunately, to, to try to get something done without making it a fiasco and a spectacle. Um, so if we get increased volatility and in, in, in some what of a pullback, Pete and I, you know, and, and the analysts working on the team, Nick, Ben, and Justin joining in June, uh, we'll, we got our radar list. We have some stocks ready to buy that, you know, if we get that sell off, we'll, we'll keep uh, deploying some of the cash we have. Again, that's why we have more cash than a normalized environment uh, or normalized level because look what's going on. There's another near-term risk event coming with the debt ceiling. And you're probably right to get some extension and then what we do the whole thing over again in uh, August or uh, September, I don't, I don't, or year end, what would be the extension if they did it on a short-term basis? Yeah, it's always hard to know, of course, that some of the things I've read is maybe into September-ish, which would, it would coincide with the excuse me, the budget process. Okay. And so it's always hard to tell, uh, yeah. but you know, it, it would also be nice if our leaders passed budgets too. <laughs> right. um, so, but yeah, it um, will, it, it, not that we want to go through this again um, a couple times in a few months, but uh, I guess there's always hope that they can, uh, you know, find some solutions to yeah. put us on a, a, a better uh, long-term path right and again you know we can't with politics always aside as portfolio managers analysts uh you know whether we think one group is right or wrong it doesn't matter my job is to you know try to uh think about the scenarios how they impact the companies the valuations the sectors and, and try to make decisions uh, on that um you know can't let any of our personal views uh they, they don't matter it matters about what i think will happen what if this happens what if that happens how do we react and, and that's kind of how we think about it yeah that's a good point randy i always like to say it's it's not what i think should happen it's what i think will happen <laughs> Right. Um, and 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 uh, managing the strategies accordingly uh, around that. So correct. Yeah. Well, all right. At this point, um, we're we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. There's there's no further questions. So we appreciate everybody for joining us today, and we hope that you'll join us again next month uh, on Tuesday, June sixth at twelve o'clock Eastern. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, and we hope everyone has a great rest of their week.